of offense. Avoiding the trap of offense. It says, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. We'll betray one another and hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. We live in an age which really is the last of the last days, and one of the signs of the last days is that people will become offended, many offended. We live in a world today where people get offended often and quickly. We live in a world today that if you drive wrong in Atlanta, you could be shot dead. That's the kind of rage that's out there in our world. We live in a crazy world because the devil's crazy. But the devil's influenced people. But offense abounds. People get offended in marriage. People get offended at church. Oh, heaven forbid, but they do. They get offended at me. They get offended at their employer. They get offended at employees. They get offended at their neighbors. There's just offense abounds in our nation and in the world we live in today. Jesus said, this is the sign of the end times. The world will be awash with offense. Doesn't take much to offend people these days. But we talk about becoming unstuck, and being, being stuck is not a good thing. You gotta get unstuck. We talked, you know, I, have you been into a, a restaurant? This has happened to me where you sit down, you put your arms down on the table, then as you try to pick it up to get something, you, you realize it's stuck. How many, how many have been there? I've been, I, I mean, it just gets all over me. I call the waitress over, give me the rag, let me clean it myself. Amen, because the person's waffles and syrup is now on my arm. Or like if you have, you, you know, you ladies, you can't get your, the, the top of the jar, whatever it is, off. You call your man in. Would you get this off? You know what we talk about? And then when you go after about... <laughs> Maybe we should throw this in the trash. Something's wrong with this thing. But, you know, getting it unstuck... Or like if you got my son, just the week before last, he was working up there and got a big old splinter in his finger. And thank God for Robert Dozier, took him out into the, the back workroom where we have a, a small operating theater. <laughs> and, he did a, and he cut it out from the, from, the, from the base and pulled it out. So being stuck's no fun. Unstuck is where God wants us to be. And you can be stuck in your marriage. You can be stuck on the judge. This dumb job. I'm stuck at this job. I'm stuck with these neighbors. Or whatever. I'm just stuck in my walk with God. God wants to get you unstuck. There's a, there's a way to do it, and the Holy Ghost wants to do it. And we talked last week about the sin of familiarity. That can get you stuck. But I believe, of all the things we're going to talk about, in fact, I cannot handle just in one sermon. There's too much. I dove into this thing. Dear Lord, this is a big topic. But if anything will keep you stuck is the spirit of offense. I've been around 27 years, full-time in ministry. I get to observe a lot. I get to see how people mature, how they grow, or how they stay the same. And my heart is everybody grows, but we've got to realize that that doesn't always happen. Luke 17, 1, Jesus says, It is impossible that no offense should come. Meaning, uh, you are going to be offended in this world. You may be offended in this sermon before you get out the door. You get to apply this right now. Amen. I had a dear brother tell me, brother, I said, like your shoes. He says, oh, those are new shoes, Pastor, because you stood on my toes so long last service, I had to get some new ones. <laughs> well, I pray it doesn't hold the same for this sermon. It'll be a little bit lighter on him. But really the key about offense, you cannot stop offenses. They're coming your way. But the key is how I process the offense, how I handle the, the offense. That's the, really the key. And if I handle it correctly, will determine whether I'm going to move forward on in life or whether I'm going to get stuck in life and uh, just see the same scenery. And so what does the Bible say about offense? Well, the Bible talks a lot about offense. You want to talk about offense, a lot of people get offended in the Bible. We talk about the first set, which you can see these people deserve to be offended, is the Pharisees. The Pharisees, out of Matthew 15, Jesus 
is speaking here. And you have to understand, Jesus is the antithesis of a seeker-sensitive preacher. He's the opposite. You say, how do I know? Well, listen to how he starts his sermon off in verse 7. Hypocrites! <laughs> this is Jesus talking now. Kind of <laughs> slap you. And then he says, uh, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And when he called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. Verse 12. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Uh, Jesus, you have to understand. You've got to catch up with the, with the times. In today's world, we have preachers that tiptoe with the truth. Hello. You're nice. You're wonderful. The world is wonderful. It's about you now. Do you feel good? Are, are you feeling good? Because the goal of this sermon is to make you feel good. You may go to hell in the process, but you'll feel good while you're here. <laughs> you know, I cannot survive in that kind of preaching because I know my flesh just wants to be petted. I tell you, now and again, you need a, a good slap. Oh, what was that? that was to, uh, that's to pay attention to get awake because you're on the sleeping at the wheel. You're going to run off the road. Amen. I won't get into it. Next week, I'll talk about the itching ear syndrome. <laughs> Scratch me. An itching. You know, if you've got an itch, it needs to be scratched. How many know that? You got an itch in your back? Honey, would you scratch right there? No, 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 higher, lower, no, no. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? If it's, if it's itching, you got to scratch it. And the whole thing about itching ears, oh, I don't, I don't want to get into it. It's another whole sermon. We don't go to hear the word that we need to hear. We go to the word that we want to hear. Come on, don't shout me down now because I'm telling you the truth. But that's another dime, another time. But what does the Bible say? Well, the Pharisees got offended. How about John the Baptist? John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. You'd think John the Baptist wouldn't get offended, but he got offended. John the Baptist, the guy with the camel skin coat, leather belt, and ate locusts. I like him. I want to meet John the Baptist. But he, look at Matthew chapter 11, and you go to the verse um, 11, 3 through 6. It says, and, and they said to him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Now listen, who wrote that? John the Baptist said that. When did he say it? He's in a stinking prison cell. Why is he there? For being completely politically incorrect. <laughs> He's brought into Herod's court because they heard about this great preacher. First thing Herod does is points his bony finger. He says, hey, you are living in adultery. The wife you have is not your wife, it's your brother's wife. Well, that cost him. <laughs> Thrown in prison. He's sitting there so long, he's wondering, my cousin, my cousin, man, I got to hook up here. I mean, this man can do miracles. Can he at least stage one little jailbreak for his cousin? I've been sitting here, sitting here. He hasn't even come to visit me. And he's getting upset. And the more he thought about it, the more upset he got to the point he says, hey, think about how profound this is. He's preaching. He's the coming Messiah. This is the Messiah. Are you the one to come or do we look for another? <laughs> he was offended. He was hurt. He was upset. But then listen to what he says. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. Every one of these it says, I'm he, I'm he. Can you do that? No. Can anybody else do that? No. It takes the power of God to pull this off. The deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who was not offended because of me. He's telling, listen, you go tell him. Don't you get offended. Listen. John the Baptist, your course is nearly over. 
but run the race strong and don't get offended. So we go down the line, and not only were the, was John offended, not only were the, disciples, were the Pharisees offended, but look at the, the disciples. If you go to John chapter 6, his closest companions were also offended. And it says in verse 52, or let's go to verse uh, 53 of chapter 6 of John's gospel. And Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now he's got no provisos. He just launches into cannibalism. <laughs> unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood is eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For, his, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. And as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, and who eats this bread will live forever. And these things he said in the, in, the, in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now listen, verse 60. Therefore the, the, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? In verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself the disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? You know, Jesus was not trying to gather a crowd. He's trying to gather disciples. He did not water down the truth. Now, later, he, he would explain the way Jesus would, would well pray. He'd tell a parable, and if you really wanted to know about it, come and ask him. He'll tell you. But if you just want to hear, just to hang around with the crowd, you're going to miss the whole point. But now they're offended. And the Bible goes on to say later down the line, if you, if you, if you, if you drop down there, then verse 64, for they are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. And there, uh, 66 is really looking for from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Think about it. Through the message, they got offended at the message. They backed off from Jesus, went to the back of the crowd, and decided just to begin to float away. Which I want to tell you is so analogous to the church. People that start in the front row, they move to the middle, they go their way to the back. I tell the ushers, hold the doors open. They're on the way out. Amen. Because people get offended at church. It doesn't take much to offend people. Because they basically, people, so many people come to church with a chip on their shoulder, daring the pastor to knock it off. Oh, I'll knock it off. I'll slap it off you. <laughs> it's going to be knocked off. But oh, don't offend me. Don't offend me. And people get offended at church. So easy. Because they're, you know, they're talking about God. It's a spiritual thing. They're close to their heart. And then people pick up and leave. And people go to this church, then they go to that church, and that church, to this church. I love what Ed said. I was at Ed's small group. He said... Ed said, I've been in the ministry for uh, like 50 years, and I've been to two churches in my life, one in California and the one here. Well, we shopped around for six months, found the right one in the name of Jesus, and it takes a while to shop around. I'm serious. We had a shop and shop, didn't we, honey? You think you find the right one until the guy gets up there and preaches doubt and unbelief? I said, dear God in heaven, I'm not subjecting my spirit to this trash. You better give me faith. You get me give me the word. I want to see the Holy Ghost move. I want to see a mission statement, what the house is all about, and hallelujah. Amen. And so it's really uh, sad to say there should be more ch uh, churches that teach the uncompromised word of God. But, um, but, but, but we're becoming rare like hen's teeth because they're afraid of the people. They don't want to offend the people. Oh, no, no, no. You didn't, they might not come back. Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen to me. I didn't ask for this job in the first place. If I can run everybody off, I can finally go to the mission field. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> be nice, Pastor. Be nice. Okay, I'll be nice. <laughs> but you cannot thrive when you take a tree and jerk it up and put it down and jerk it up and put it down and jerk it up and put it down. You can't thrive that way. They that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. If you want to flourish, find out where you're supposed to be, plant there. Will offenses come? Yes, they will. Work through it in Jesus' name. Don't be so touchy. Some people sit there looking like they're ready to head up. They sit there like sideways, ready to go out the door. 
<laughs> Hallelujah to Jesus. But then those disciples, they were offended. And I love what he said, verse 67. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you want to also go? Because he talks about, he would not compromise to keep people. But the, the, but the disciples, nonetheless, were offended. And then lastly, we go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, it gets right down close to you when you've got your own relatives and your own neighbors and those who grew up around you get offended at you. But we find this, his own neighbors were offended at him. Matthew 13 uh, and verse uh, 54. He said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Like, who does he think he is? You know, your relatives don't mind you being prosperous, but just don't be too prosperous. Be successful, but don't be too successful. When you show up for Thanksgiving, don't drive your good car. Drive the one your son's driving. <laughs> They'll ask you for less help that way. Amen. <laughs> By the man of God, he is a very wealthy man. He says, you know, I could drive a Bentley into church, but I knew there'd be a line out the door when I left. I said, you're right. <laughs> There's a price for everything. But he says, verse 55, is this not the carpenter's son? Man, didn't this Jesus work with Joseph, put together chairs and tables and all kinds of implements for, uh, made out of wood? I mean, who is this guy? Is not his mother Mary? We know Mary. And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not also with us? And where do men get these things? I mean, they're getting off on this whole thing. They, and listen to what the last verse says in 57. So they were offended at him. Amazing. He's just trying to teach the word. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. Now, this hasn't happened to me yet. Because it only can happen to you one time. Without a miracle, you can't do it again. But in Luke 4, he's preaching his first sermon. And for a while, he's going real good. But then he offended them. He offended them when he said there was a Naaman the Syrian who had leprosy, but not one man or woman of Israel ever got healed of leprosy except the Syrian, a non-Jew. And there's a widow of Zarephath, a non-Jew. She was starving in famine when all the food was gone from Israel, and not one Israelite got this miracle, but she did. She had enough food to feed her for the rest of the famine. They got so mad. You know why they got mad? Because Jesus was telling them, if you are the faith of God, you could have the miracle. But you don't have the faith, the miracle can't work for you. Now, religious people want to put everything on God. They are just, I'm just a leaf floating down the river of life. <laughs> turning, turning, never know which way I'm going. <laughs> just... Floating along, along he, I mean, just, I'm, they teach us from pulpits. They teach this thing, you just, no, listen. No, here's what God says. I put you in a boat with a motor, and it's running. And where you end up in life is because where you steered yourself. People don't like that. People like blame. People like entitlement. People don't like to be told something that says, no, it's you. If you've got a problem in life, go in the bathroom, and look in the mirror, and there you are, the problem. <laughs> the problem. You have just met the problem. It's you. People don't like that. People today, right now, there's people right now, right, right now, you're smiling, but it's like, <laughs> I'm going to a church where you're great. Everything's great. The devil ain't that bad either. He's been, he's been given a bad rap, I'm telling you. So they tried to kill him. Can you imagine preaching a sermon? They are so offended that they grab him. And I've been to Nazareth. I've seen the cliff. It's several hundred feet high. When you get thrown off that thing, you're not bouncing back. But the Bible says he turned invisible. Went through their mist. They're going, where's he going? Where's he? Where's he at? <laughs> There's one thing they had in common. 
whether it was the Pharisees, John the Baptist, the disciples, or his own neighbors, they all became offended. And another thing that's in common, when they became offended, the, the results were the same. They lost respect for the authority. They backed away and got stuck. No miracles were done in Nazareth except a few, a few sick folk. A couple of headaches, but no major miracles. The miracle power was shut off. The Pharisees did not receive the light of life of the Lord Jesus. I don't know where they are today, but I very few made it to heaven. They lost their eternal destiny. Offense will cause you to miss out on the plan of God for your life. It will cause you to short-circuit his purpose. And so this subject is not a minor subject. It's a major subject, particularly in the church, because the devil walks around making sure you get offended, and he tells you to your head, you need to leave this church. And if you get to the root of why you're leaving, it's always an offense. Now, if Jesus tells you to leave, that's fine. You can come or go as you want. We'll love you coming, love you going. That's how we operate around here. Amen? It's a free country, and you can come and go as the Holy Ghost leads you. But let the Holy Ghost lead you. The problem with charismatic churches, we use this phraseology, which is a truism, but then we pervert it. Uh, well, I feel it. I'm feeling led. Like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to buy me the biggest hunk of molten lead. I'm going to sit on my desk like a mountain. When people start telling me, I feel lead, I go, I feel lead too. <laughs> I feel that lead right under my hand. I feel that lead. <laughs> I feel it. I feel lead. I got to go now. No, that's your flesh rearing up because it got hurt a little in the name of Jesus, and you don't want to be told something you don't want to hear. I mean, I, 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 you know, I love people, but I've learned one thing about people. I can't change them. It takes a, it's a God thing. So I can give them the word, give them direction, give them encouragement, give them love. I have no other agenda. I'm, I'm your ladder holder to get you as high up for your life that you can go in the things of God. There's no other agenda. I'm not into this for myself. I'm into it for you. I really mean that. And these sermons I give you, they may slap you a little bit, but they're to help you. I'll never forget now. I'm going to tell you this example. Do not try to figure out who this is. People do that in here. I'm taking this, this from way years ago. They're no longer here. been years since they've been here. And I'm not mentioning names and anything else. But this couple... We poured hours into them, hours, counseling and burping and this and that and this and that. You know, people get, you have to realize it's just one of me. People get offended like, hey, you didn't text me back. My God, do you want to see how many texts I got? The email, how come, hey, I get them in inches weekly. The phone, the phone, you didn't call me. Hey, hey. You know, chill. I will get to every email. I will get to every text. I will get to every phone as I plow through the hundreds. So help me, I'll get to you. But don't go get so, let's be good. Then email me. You know, and I'm pretty open with what I got, but dear God, let me, I'm just one human being. Don't get so offended. Amen. The people get late. You know, if I'm not late, blessed be God, he said he'd be here at four. Uh, now it's three after four. Five after four, I'm out the door. Can you take a chill pill? I mean, Lord have mercy. We're working as hard as we can, aren't we, Carolyn Moore, to, 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 to formulate our own counseling department. She's a registered counselor, a master's degree, and we're launching. We get 275. We're going to have, have, we'll give you all the counseling you want. You want, you want counseling? Help yourself. But I can't counsel everybody because it's just a time. I love counsel. I love to help people. I can't do it to everybody. Does that make sense? So, <laughs> but people, they, these people, and I was counseling, and then uh, they, were, they, were, they were in the lobby. I'll never forget it. And, and they were just, and what they were saying, you know what, Pastor? People aren't loving us. 
we're not getting the help we need around here. I remember going, my God. I said, listen, you know what's wrong with you? You are a self-centered, selfish little couple. <laughs> that it's all about you and wiping your little... Now, there wasn't a rub, you know, your snot little nose. You need to grow up and get a life. Now, I had about two, three years before I got there. But I had to feel like they needed to be corrected. Well, you know what happened? You think, that, you know, Pastor, I received that. I, I need that. No. Both of them, together. You ever seen a hen... Puff up in a court. I remember going out there. I mean, looking back at me. Years have come and gone. You go through decades. Decade, decade one, decade two. You watch the decades fly by. What are you doing for God? Well, we're in recovery. Recovery? My God, how long does it take to get recovered? <laughs> I'll tell you why you're in, in recovery. Because you were offended. You live in offense. You carry offense. It sticks you. Like a big red plunger under your life. <laughs> and you can try as much as you want to. But you are not getting very far from where you just got stuck. Maybe if you came back to me and say, you know, about 15 years ago, we took a wrong turn. If you repent, God will start growing you. But if you walk around offended, you're going to be stuck right there. Stay a baby. You go to, well, here comes Brother Doodad into heaven. He's waddling, got his rattler and his three-cornered pants. <laughs> At least he made it. <laughs> but what happens is, when you get offended, you end up withdrawing from God. You end up pulling back on God. That's what happens through offense. Well, I'm offended. I feel like reading the Word today. I feel like praying in the Holy Ghost for two or three hours because I'm offended. No, it's usually the other way around. And so what is offense? The word offense in the Greek means, scan, not means, says scandalon, scandalon. It's the name of the part of a of a trap. It's a trap. But it's part of the trap. It's the trap we put the bait on. And when the bait's taken, the trap is set. And when the trap comes down, you cannot go anywhere. You're stuck. You're not moving. Now, growing up in, I actually grew up in Atlanta. And uh, I grew up where you could hunt inside the perimeter. We used to hunt squirrel and all kinds of game and dove. We shoot dove and inside the perimeter. There was so much open land. 285, just pieces of it. We'd go down, Chatt we'd, we'd, we'd go down the Chattahoochee River and we'd shoot all kinds of stuff. Well, are you... Listen, don't look at me that way. If you eat a, if you eat a chicken in your life, a chicken had to die for you. Amen? <laughs> it doesn't come out of the freezer. Someone killed that poor little thing. who was sitting there, chick! This is for Mary. Chop. Amen. <laughs> and Albert the cow, he bit the bullet too for you. You had one hamburger, one time. Amen. <laughs> Don't get me started on this stuff here. Someone's got to die so you can live. It's just called life. Amen. Amen. Breathe in slowly. You'll get over it. Amen. Amen. So I said, I, I went to my friends and said, well, let's just trap some of these animals. And I'll just not. And so I, I bought this thing. The big, big thing's called, it's called a have a heart trap. I mean, it doesn't snap them with metal, but it keeps them in a cage. And the way it operates, you take this thing, and it's like a, it looks like a corridor, a graded corridor. And in the middle, there's a little tray. And I found the bait that gets every animal in the woods. You know what it is? Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. They, people, I mean, rabbits eat that, squirrels eat that, possums eat that. But every animal in the woods, where's that peanut butter and jelly? Man? <laughs> it's a common denominator. I want to eat that. And so they come in there. We catch these big old raccoons. They come in there, and it looks open. It looks harmless. That's why offense is so beguiling. I, mean, I have a right to be offended. I have a right to feel this way. And I come in there, and... Uh, 
This, I mean, this raccoon comes in there, and as soon as it picks that bread up, the door shut, left and right. Tunk. <laughs> Tunk. What's so funny? I never saw an uneaten sandwich. It always, well, <laughs> might, as well finish, might as well finish it off. Since I'm here, might as well drop it down, man. And then, and then, and then, and then you, then you, then you get there, and you know, and, you know, you feel sorry for them. They're like, you know, you know, these big animals. I couldn't believe the size of animals. There's huge raccoons in there, like all squashing like this, like this. They couldn't even move. I said, Clyde, I was in there, buddy. And you know what's just so analogous of our lives? Offense brings bitterness. Anger, resentment. Amen. Now listen, you need to take that child care if you can. All right? Amen. Let me say, while I'm talking about offense, let me talk about this while we're all here. And I won't just, but let me just say this to you. Everybody breathe in, breathe out. Okay, here we go. Listen, you need to take your child. I realize a certain time you want your baby, it's one month old, this, that, but you need to get your babies. And Carol and I are good friends. She knows. She's taking her daughter's baby. Bring the babies. Here's what I want you to begin to work towards. Your babies need to go in the nursery. Because here's what happens. When you keep your baby till they're a toddler, then at two, the toddler is put in the toddler room. And when mama goes, all oh, hell breaks loose. Mama! <laughs> I go by the toddler room. I think, they're, I think people are dying in there. And the, and the teachers tell me, Pastor, it's like Vogue now. People want to hang on to their babies. I understand because maybe you're in daycare and you want to hold the baby much you can. But in the house of God, when your baby cries, it pulls everybody out of it. Therefore, we have this insulated wall, this thick, full of insulation right there. The most beautiful soft music plays, rockers and capable people that we check out. And I know it's a step of faith. My baby, I'm giving to you. I'm trusting God. You'll get it back. You'll get it back. You'll get it back. Amen? But you need to be about getting your kids, listen to me, I'm your pastor trying to help you, to the nursery and to the children. Say, well, I, no, no, no. Where's your faith? If you do not have enough faith to put your child in the child care, you need to seriously find another church that can give you enough faith to do that. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, Carol, you know that's okay. We just talked. I've been meaning to talk about it for some time. I thought I'd do it at another time. And, but I'm speaking about offense, so I thought I'd just test it. <laughs> See how we're doing out there. <laughs> uh, but I love, I love all the babies, and I love all the parents. And it doesn't mean you can't come here with the baby, but, you know, when it gets up a little bit, just put it in there. Amen. So, um, this thing about uh, offense is designed to stop you from fulfilling God's plan. It really is. It's the devil's number one tool. It's his number one weapon. And the word offense and stumbling block. Have you heard of the word stumbling block? I didn't realize this. I looked up the word stumbling block. About half the time the word stumbling block is used in the Bible is the exact same word for scandalon, which is the word for offense. So they're interchangeable, meaning that if you stumble on a pathway, you can be knocked out of the way. Remember Chris and I, this is my son Chris, and uh, it's great seeing you in the front row. <laughs> my son Chris and I worked, walked the AT, and the AT, which is the Appalachian Trail, a lot of times is a very narrow path with a very steep drop off. You better pay attention. If you take a misstep, you couldn't end up at the bottom of the mountain. I remember this one dear brother who was out there not paying attention, and next thing you heard this, ah, and he rolled down the mountain. He rolled down the mountain and ended up, but we managed to save him and get him out, amen, because he wasn't paying attention. It's the same scenario. A stumble, when you stumble, you get off the path of what God has for you. And so it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 23, for instance, it says, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to the Jews, a stumbling block simply means the word scandal on. Stumbling block and uh, trap offense is the same word. The stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, 1 Peter 2.8. 
and it simply means to cause you to miss the way. So what does offense bring? We, we've, we've talked about it. It brings the hurt. But ultimately, it brings separation. It tries to, when you have someone in authority and you become offended at them, then you no longer trust the authority. You back away from the authority. You kind of distrust it, and you no longer look to them for guidance. When Joseph became this man with his dream, he shared the dream with his brothers, and he shared the next dream with his brothers. You would think they would embrace him and say, way to go, brother, we're for you, this is awesome. They did not. They became offended and tried to separate themselves from him. It's amazing, people, when they get offended, they feel like, if I can just blow out your candle, then my candle will burn brighter. No, it doesn't work that way, folks. But what happened is they got offended. In Moses' day, when he was working with the children of Israel, they were getting offended all the time. They just crossed the Red Sea, seen a miracle, and in Exodus 17, the Bible says the first thing they do, they start getting thirsty. We're going to die. We don't have any water. We're going to take you out, Moses. They got offended because they were thirsty. And God had them intervene and open up the rock with a touch of the staff, and rock, the, the rock split open, and water came out. And guess what? They got, they, 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 they got over it. But you go look throughout the 10 times that Israel was tested. Every test, the root of it was an offense. They would get offended by not having enough. They get offended for God wasn't coming through. They got offended at Moses. In number 16, we had Korah show up with his two buddies, Abathar and Dathan. And they said, you know what? We're as good as you. Who do you think you are? Who made you the head of us, leading us through all these woods, all these wilderness trails? We're sick of it. We're as good as you are. You know what Moses said? He, Moses fell at his face and said, listen, oh God, have mercy on him. And he says to them, he gets up, he says, listen, if, if this is God giving me this directive, then I'm asking him that the earth would open up under all of the families that are coming against me, and they'll go down and get swallowed up, and you'll know it's God. He had not got the words out of his mouth, and all of a sudden the mouth opens up, whoom, Korah, Dathan, Abathar, all their wives, their children, their dogs, their cats, and everything they own went straight down the hole. Bam! Slam shut. You'd think that would stop the offense. It didn't. The next day, the children of Israel gathered at Moses' door, the whole congregation, saying, we're offended at you. We're offended that you'd kill these people like this. You're not bringing life. You're, you're, you're creating murder. And that time, oh, God got so mad. You know you can get God mad. Don't get God mad. A plague broke out. And Aaron had to run with a censer. And he's a type of Christ standing between the living and the dead. And he ran. And as fast as he ran, he was still too late. He couldn't get everybody. But thank God. But 15,000 Israelites died that day. They buried them. Then finally, they shut up. Offense, death. Offense gets swallowed up. Can I tell you the analogy is true for today? Offense will stop the power of God. Offense will swallow up the plan of God for your life. Nothing but offense can stop you and nothing like offense can stop you. It's got, to be, it's got to become your greatest enemy. Amen. You cannot tolerate offense. The Bible talks about this in Hebrews 3.13. But exhort one another daily, while it's still called today, lest any of you be hardened through, through the deceitfulness of sin. It's very easy to get offended, then you get hard. Because you get hurt. You notice people that have been through a lot? You can see it in their face sometimes. To protect themselves, they get hard. But that hardness stops God from really wanting to talk to them like he wants to talk to them. And so God has the trouble getting through people that have a hard heart. And the Bible talks about deceitfulness of sin. Sin has a way of tricking you into saying, well, you deserve to be hard. See what the hardness is? See, you see what's going on? But you know what? Sin's deception is this. In verse 12, it, it, it says, that the, what was the sin? The sin was departing from the living God. When you walk with God, you trust Him. Your life's in His hands. Get your hands off your life. Show people will offend you, but you leave it to Him. Amen. And walk in faith and be clear of offense. But your offense can cost your ministry. Your offense can cost your life. So how do I become unstuck from the trap of offense? Real quickly. Number one, 
recognize that any offense in your life is a trap from the enemy. You have got to make that assertion. When I'm offended, this is a test. How am I going to pass this test? The devil wants me offended. He wants me to withdraw. He wants me to go back. He wants me to get stuck. I refuse in the name of Jesus. I refuse. I'm going to not allow my movement to be stopped in the things of God. Number two, you've got to avoid offense at all costs. You've got to make a decision. I'm not tolerating offense in my life. I've got to see it as a trap. I've got to get out of the way of its, of its uh, devouring power. Romans 16, 17 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. You know, people with offense are contagious. They go negative and they want to satisfy their negative. They want you to agree with them. Excuse me. I remember, I, there's, I won't mention this person's, any position in my life, but there's this person. She's a woman. She is a wife and a mother. She had a little girl. They were at a big church. She decided, I'm going to put my little girl in the drama. But she didn't realize that drama comes with drama. And so she had her little girl up there, and they went through the first practice, and she was doing great. And then they needed a, well, we need you here for Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and then some on Saturday. And she went around to people say, can you believe they're asking us to come for three more days? And you know what the answer she got from that church? Because they were well-trained. We do what we're called to do. If you don't want to do it, get out of the drama. She said she kind of got <clears throat> sucked in her offense. The next day, that offense rose up again. Here I am with my daughter. Got to wait for my daughter. She talked to somebody else. And then somebody else. But every time she talked to anybody else in that church, they'd give her the same answer. Uh, we don't go negative here. We don't go at we don't go into offense. And she said it taught her a lesson after about the third or fourth or fifth person. She says, oh, I get it. You don't get offended. <laughs> oh, and, uh, if you, and if you don't want to, just get out of the, get out of the drama. <laughs> Hallelujah. Think about it. <laughs> Think about it. And so you got to avoid people. I do not hang around negative people. I do not hang around. Even ministers can go negative. I will not be friends. I have literally walked away from close friendships because every time I get around them, they're going negative on some other minister. Forget it. I'm not hanging around you. Well, that is, I tell you, did you, did you hear the latest? Oh, my gosh. Now what's going down the line? I don't want to be around you. I like people that believe God. In fact, I, I had my... Even my, uh, 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 a minister, he was on the border of a major ministry down in Tulsa, Tulsa, Jerusalem. And every time he came back, he had another boatload, barge load of information, secret information about what was happening behind the scenes. I said, I'm getting overloaded. If these people are doing all that, I'll have not one hero left. I mean, dear God in heaven, I don't want to know. Just let me be in faith. Amen. I'm sure God's working out with these people. Amen. But I want to avoid, avoid people. That's what the Bible says. Going to bring division, going to bring strife. Stay away from them. You know the scripture, it's a, it's, it's a song that goes, I cannot be defeated and I will not quit. Saved by the blood of Jesus, I'm loose from Satan's grip. Jesus Help me now. Jesus fought and he won the battle and he gave it all to me. I cannot be defeated. I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm free. But I was doing that. As I'm putting this sermon together, this came to me. And I just said, yes. I see it. I cannot be offended and I will not quit. Saved by the blood of Jesus, I'm loose from Satan's grip. Because Satan will grip you when you get offended. So I'm going to make up my mind that I cannot be offended all the time. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Well, let me try. At least let me try. And so it goes on. Number three, 
you've got to refuse to become offended by walking in the love of God. You say, listen, I'm going to walk in the love of God. It really comes down to this. 1 John 2.10 says, He who loves his brother and abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. That word stumbling is a word offense. When you walk in the light of God's love, you cannot be offended. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love suffers long and is kind. And in the King James, it says, love's not easily offended. The translators put in the word easily because they just couldn't believe <laughs> that you could actually write, love is never provoked. God sets the standard, folks. In the kingdom, don't get offended. Doesn't mean you don't get hurt. Doesn't mean people will step on you. But you take it to God. You say, God, I forgive him. I release him. I choose to walk in love. I will not live my life offended. Amen? Now, I'm giving you some meat today. This, 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 this is not party frosting. This is T-bone steak, one of those 48 ounces. Just chew it. It's, it's, it's really good the more you chew. And so it's, and then the fourth thing is this. We've got to submit our lives to God. You know, the Bible says, my time's in your hands. When you've got to get off your hands off the steering wheel and just realize, you know what? People will sometimes abuse me. Sometimes I'll be mistreated. Sometimes things will happen to me. But I am not going to respond with offense. I'm going to put my hands in the air. The Bible says in James 4, 7, submit myself to God and resist the devil and he will flee from me. When I submit my life to God, I say, no devil of offense. You're not putting that wounded spirit on me. I refuse it in Jesus' name. Get out of my life in the name of Jesus. God will bring healing. Exodus 14, 14. I love that scripture. It says, the Lord says, I will fight for you. You will hold your peace. Give these things open, uh, over to God. I'm telling you what, you can live a life that is offense-free in the name of Jesus. As a matter of fact, you should have such a reputation in you that you become like a duck. Your, the, your feathers are so waxed up when somebody pours the fence on you, it rolls right off your back. Hallelujah. You're like a Labrador coming out of a stream. You just shake it off. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And stay happy. Hallelujah. Nothing drains your joy than offense. They offended me. You can be offended before you even get in your car, before you leave today. They will, will, will send somebody out there, or you'll be slighted, or say something. or You've got to realize that the devil's out there trying to trap you, trap you, trap you, trap you, trap you. Confine your space. You've got to make it say, no, I'm not being in a trap. I'm not being living in a confined space. I'm going to live unstuck. I'm going to live without harboring any offense. I'm going to allow God to unfold his plan for my life. I'm going to live free. Hallelujah. Bow your heads with me. Father, today I want to thank you today that your word has sets us free. It's been given to keep us free. And Father, there's some of us here today that would say to you, there are some offenses in my life that I'm dealing with right now. With my husband, with my wife, with my boss with perhaps an elder of this church, maybe a member of this church, or maybe even with this pastor here. But you heard the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord says, you must live above offense. Offense will cause you to go backward. But I want to pray for you. I don't want you to leave here the same way you came in. If you've been offended, someone stepped on your life. And it's genuine. It's real hurt. It's real pain. God can heal it, but you could be willing to release it and make a decision. You will not operate in offense anymore. By the grace of God in your life, you're going to rise above offense and you're going to walk in the love of God. It will no longer become a stumbling block, a trap for you. You'd say to me, Pastor, that's me. God's been speaking to me. There's some things in my life, people in my life that I'm dealing with what they've done to me. I want to get over it. If that's you, raise your hand. Say, that's me. Pastor, pray for me. Hands going up all over this place. In the balcony, put your hand up there. In the name of Jesus. God's speaking to you. God's speaking to you. In the name of Jesus. Okay, put your hand down. If you're here today, and if you had Jesus Christ walk right up to your face, would you know that you are born of the Spirit? Or would you have to look away? 
I'm telling you, church is a place where you can get your life right with God. If you have never received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, let Him in today. I believe people are going to receive Him. They're going to come. Jesus wants to come in your life. He wants to clear out all the offenses. He wants to heal your heart. But you've got to let Him in. You've got to let Him in. Or you may be here today and you know you're not right with God. You may be saved, but you know the sin in your life it needs to get out. This stuff that's happening needs to get out. It needs to be put under the blood. And you need to make your heart right today. Do it today. If that's you, either make Christ your Lord and your Lord and Savior or to make your life right with God. Quickly slip your hand and say, that's me. Pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me, Pastor. Please pray for me. Thank you for that hand. Thank you. Another hand. Thank you. Another hand. Another hand right there. Thank you. In the, in the balcony, someone downstairs. Say, yeah, Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me? I want my life right with God. If you raise your hand on, a, on those last two, or if you raise your hand on the first one, I'd like everybody to stand right where you are. Just stand right up where you are. I want to pray for you right where you are in the name of Jesus. Quickly. Don't think about it. Don't even think about it. I'm going to pray for you. Stand up. If you cannot stand when the pastor asks you to stand, how do you expect God to help you when you cannot follow a simple directive like stand? It's so important that you just, pastor says stand, I'm going to stand. That's how you get blessed. Hallelujah. Now I want to pray for you, then you're going to make a confession. Lord, I pray for all those that are standing in the name of Jesus. Lift your hands up, you're going to receive the anointing of God. God, I'm praying for the anointing right now. Holy Spirit, would you come and descend on those that are standing? Those who want to get their life right with God, find Jesus. Oh Lord, get rid of all offense. 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 Holy Spirit, come in your matchless power and the greatness of your love begin to saturate and rest upon those that are standing here today. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Now, He's coming. I sense His presence right now. He comes to bring healing. He comes to bring restoration. In the name of Jesus. Father, I just believe in Jesus' name that you're going to give great grace to those that are standing. That they'll be able to stand up and walk over and overcome all spirits of offense. That, Lord, they're being delivered even now in Jesus' name as they submit it all to you and forgive those that offended them. And, Lord, have just set it aside and say, God, I refuse to be offended. I refuse as, a, as an act of my will. I choose to release these that have hurt me. And I choose to receive your love right now in Jesus' name. He loves you tonight, today. He loves you. That's his love coming into you. God, give them great grace to walk this out. To walk this out, offense-free. They'll pass every test and grow like a mighty oak tree planted by the rivers of water. And it'll bear much fruit this year under this open heaven, Lord, you promised us in the year of 2014. Now everybody just say this out loud and those standing say it. Say in the name of Jesus, I refuse the trap of offense. Devil, you'll not contain me. You will not thwart the plan of God. But I shall rise up above all offense. All offense. I, will I will live there, offense free, in Jesus, name. in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you Father, for, the thank you. for the, love of God. the love of God. May it be enlarged in my heart, in grow in my heart, in my heart. Pushing, out pushing out all hurt and offense. Hurt and offense. In, the in the name of Jesus, I shall run my course. I shall, run my course. I shall finish my race. I shall, I shall become all that God's created me to become in the mighty name of Jesus. Now I want to pray this salvation prayer for those that are prayed, but pray it with me. Say, Dear Jesus, I need you. I need a fresh start. I repent of sins I shouldn't be dealing with. I turn my back on sin. I turn my back on this world. Forgive me, Jesus. Come into my life. Make me brand new. Thank you for a new start. A new beginning. Freedom in Jesus. I receive it now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.